Hi, this is Truth Talks. I'm Chris Hyland. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, before we get started, please like, subscribe, uh, send this to a friend. We'd love to get the, uh, the viewership up. <clears throat> but today we're going to be talk, jumping in with Frank Turek as he answers one of the most common questions in apologetics asked by both seekers and debaters alike. And that is, uh, if God is good, why is there so much evil and suffering? Or if God, why evil? Um, he's going to have a, a really well done video, but we're going to jump right in. We'll listen to Frank. And then we've got some thoughts on the back end. Let's jump. Yes, ma'am. What's your name? Hello, my name's Ayo. Say um, again? Ayo. Ayo. Yes. Nice to meet you. Um, it's a question about suffering. Um, mm -hmm. How do you answer a question if someone asks you, if there is a God, why is there so much suffering in the world? Excellent question. Um, I had uh, a question like that at the university or at um, Michigan State University. In fact, um, I knew before, the, before we ever got to the Q&A that there was an atheist in the audience um, because he sat for the entire two-hour presentation like this. <laughs> and I had some pretty good jokes in there. <laughs> and he didn't crack a smile once. So I knew that when the Q&A came up, that there, were going to be, there was going to be some trouble. So I said, are there any questions? And his hand shot up right away. I said, yes, sir. He said, if there is a good God, why doesn't he stop all the evil in the world? I said, sir, that is an excellent question. Maybe because if he did, he might start with you <laughs> and me. That's a great point that Frank makes. We often put ourselves in the position of we're not evil, and why is there so much evil around us? But we, we, have to, we have to remember that from God's perspective, we are absolutely evil. All of us are fallen. All of us, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. So that's a great point that Frank makes. Because we do evil every day. You ever notice that? We're always complaining about somebody else doing evil. Why don't you stop him? Why don't you stop her? We never think of ourselves. If God wanted to stop all the evil in the world, he might start with us. <clears throat> and then I said... Sir, we could talk about that for semesters in here. We don't have that time. I'd rather show you a one minute and 46 second video that will not be a complete answer, but will give you a doorway to an answer. So I'm going to show you the video now, the video I showed him, and then we'll, we'll go from there. You guys ready? Yes. Okay, let's make sure I got the right video here. Are you ready? You gotta pay attention. There's a lot going on in a minute 46. Here we go. Is God good? If he is, why is there suffering and evil? Let's assume for the moment that God is all powerful. This means that God can do anything that is logically possible. So he can create galaxies and subatomic particles and rainforests and you. But God cannot do what is logically impossible. He cannot make a square circle or a one-ended stick. So can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? No. So what if when God created human beings, he wanted them to be free? Freedom's a good thing, but if humans are to be free, they cannot be forced to obey God because freedom without choice is like a square circle. It's a logical contradiction. No choice, no freedom. God didn't want robots. He wanted real people. The first humans endowed with the awesome power of free choice abused their freedom. The tragic consequences of their bad choice and our bad choices ripple across the world. God is responsible for the fact of freedom, but humans are responsible for their acts of freedom. But let's remember, we don't suffer alone. God will put an end to suffering and evil. And God became a man to suffer with us. God is good, and he wants real people like you to know him. But the free choice is yours. Now, now, now that answer only opens the door, right? It just talks about free will, because in order to have love, you got to have free will, but free will often also opens up the problem for evil. Now, I made a mistake in answering your question. Here's the mistake I made. Um, normally, 
Well, there's really two answers to this question. Well, there's a lot of answers, but there's two categories of answers. The question I should have asked you back is, why do you ask the question? Right? Because if you're asking the question from an academic perspective, if God, why evil, this is how you answer it. But if you're asking the question from, you just experienced a personal tragedy, this is not how to answer it. Right? right? You don't need a philosopher, you need a pastor. Cool. So, I actually just made a mistake answering that question. I always, because, I, you know, you think, I got a good slide for this. No. Wrong answer. So we'll stop there. And let's dump it, let, let's pick up where Frank left off and talk about the big question. How do we square, how do we reconcile a good God with all the evil and suffering in the world? And we'll look at it from both the philosophical and the pastoral sense. So let's jump back. We'll look at Genesis 1-1 and all the way through Genesis 2, where we see the creation account. God creates all of the cosmos, including human beings, and he creates human beings to be in relationship with him. So he gives us free choice. However, in Genesis 3, we see the result of that. Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. They not only chose to disobey God and eat the fruit, but then they hid from him, and then they blame shifted when they were asked. So we see in that action, in that act of disobedience, that Adam and Eve introduce sin into the world. They broke God's perfect world. When God created the world, he said it was very good. It was perfect. But in that act of disobedience, Adam and Eve broke the world. And they introduced sin and death, not only into themselves, but into all of creation. As the Bible says, creation itself groans as in labor pains, waiting for, for Christ to return and set all things right. So man in his disobedience introduces evil, he introduces death, he introduces disease, he introduces all of the, the cataclysmic natural events that we see in the world today. And that is compounded by now thousands of years of human beings making their own sinful choices and basically piling on and adding to that. So we see a world that is evil and we see men with free choice who is able to then, because God loves us, he still gives us that free choice. And as Frank said, uh, there will come a day when God comes and he puts an end to all evil. But we have to step back and say, and realize that we are part of that evil. When we ask God to put an end to that evil over there or this evil over here, but we leave ourselves out of the equation, we do everyone a disservice. There's an old adage that says, we often, we, we judge our actions by our motives, but we judge other people's motives by their actions. And it's a very short-sighted way to do things. So we have to realize that we are part of that evil. And when God eradicates all evil, that would include us because the standard of God is perfection. And we are so far from that standard. Even if we look and, and think over there's a rapist, over there's a murderer, over there is uh, uh, somebody who commits genocide, uh, or over there is somebody who, who, who uh, preys on people for money. But I didn't do that. However, our own evil actions in God's sight are just as bad. And so we have this problem of evil, but we know that God is good. And we can see that because God entered into his creation. He didn't just leave us to suffer alone, but Christ came. The God of the universe humbled himself, put on flesh and became a man and became, became part of the creation. And he actually suffered all things that human beings suffer from every, he's tempted in every way that we are yet without sin. And he willingly went to a Roman cross, the most excruciating way to die. The Romans were incredible in, 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 their, in their innovations, not only in terms of civics and architecture and engineering, but they invented one of the most painful, excruciating and uh, drawn out ways to die in crucifixion. And Christ suffered that on our behalf. So he suffered with us. God, God entered in and said, I will suffer with you to prove, to, to show you that I am with you in this. And when he rose again from the dead, he said, I am coming back. There is coming a day when God will return and he will put an end to all evil. But in this middle period, God is allowing for free choice. He is allowing for human beings to freely choose him in the midst of all of this suffering, in the midst of all the negative circumstances, because that, because that free choice is love. And when we love God, then we can be 
present with God when he, when he returns. And the Bible tells us that, uh, you know, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. So when he went to that cross, he took the evil that we are responsible for, and he took that debt upon himself. Now, in this middle period, we often wonder, well, why doesn't God just curtail evil? He already has. But he goes a step further and says that even in the midst of this, God will work all the evil that exists in the world for good. Romans 8.28 says that God works all things, even the evil things, even the death of a baby, even, even a natural disaster, even, uh, you know, a teenage son who hits black ice and is gone, you know, in an instant. Even the death and the suffering and the disease that we see said God works all things together for good to those that love him. So in all of this midst, God is working good. And even for those who don't yet believe, God is using the evil of this world and the circumstances in their life to bring them to a point that they have the opportunity to accept Christ. There are some things that we have to hit rock bottom before we ever look up and ask for help. And there are some people that have to be brought to rock bottom to get to the point where they say, yes, I want Jesus. And the Bible says that this life, this 70, 80, 90 years that we have on earth is but a vapor compared to all of eternity. So God is less concerned with the 70 or 80 years on this earth in terms of our quality of life or whether we're suffering or not, but he's far more concerned about us choosing to accept his sacrifice for our sins because that determines all of eternity. So that's why in 2 Peter it said, God is not slack concerning his promise. 2 Peter 3.21 says, he's not slack, but is long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and faith. So he delays judgment. He delays judgment. He delays actually putting an end to evil so that more and more and more people can make the free choice to be with him in heaven. Because when God does come back, he will put an end to all evil. And it says, the Bible says he will not contend with man forever. So there is coming a day when those who have chosen over and over and over and over again to reject God and say, God, I don't want you in my life. I don't want to do it your way. I want to live life without you. When God comes back to deal with evil, he will take all of those who have chosen to be without him and they will be without him forever. The problem is they will also be without all of his attributes, all of the common grace that we enjoy today, things like warmth, things like light, things like friendship and love and compassion. All those things that are of God will not be present. When he withdraws his presence from people completely, they will be without all of those things. And that is the torment that hell describes. And so that's why God delays coming back and judging evil and eradicating it because he wants us to freely choose him. So now freely choose him today. Start living eternal life today. Start living the abundant life today. 